In this week's streaming audio, we're talking to Justin Lee and Dennis Whittakin about cloud networking, specifically cloud networking for Kafka. It's one of those topics where you'd like it to be straightforward, you know, here's the URL, off you go. But if you've ever worked with a company that's large enough to have its own networking team, then you'll know it can often be a lot more complicated than that. There are often restrictions on what you can or can't do, policies you need to comply with. And when that kind of stuff comes up, you really need to know what your networking options are. That's something that Dennis and Justin have been dealing with for a long time for a lot of different companies. So they recently filmed a course all about it. And I wanted to get them in, get the cheat sheet from them, figure out what are the options, what strategies work for which kinds of company, and you know maybe get some soft tips on them on how to get everyone to agree on the right solution. Before we get started, this podcast is brought to you by Confluent Developer, which is our Kafka tutorial site. Head to developer.confluent.io for Justin and Dennis's course and lots more courses besides. But before you do, I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Streaming Audio. Let's get into it. My guests today are Justin Lee and Dennis Whittakind. Hi, gentlemen. Hello. How's it going? Hi. Good to have you here. Um, Justin, now let me see if I've got this right. Justin, you're a solutions engineer. That's correct. Yes. That means fixing people's problems generally, right? Yeah, sort of, right? Part of it's, you know, helping customers get up and started, actively. And then Dennis does more of the fixing the problem. Yeah, and Dennis, you are, I love this one, you're a customer, customer success technical architect. You nailed it. There it is. Which is a CSTA, and I'm told some people abbreviate to Siesta. Correct. Which yep. I love. That's very casual. Our goal is to make customers be able to take a nap, right? <laughs> and not because you're boring. No, no. <laughs> it's all their problems and they don't have to stay up all night. And They're so know, relaxed. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So um, we brought you in to talk about networking because uh, you've just released a course, like a nitty gritty nuts and bolts course on the cloud networking. Justin, I, th I think you were the face for much of that, all of that? Yeah, I... Um... I, I wrote some of the content and then I recorded the actual lecture components and then Dennis did the the labs and the demos and you can talk a little bit about oh, okay that. you juggled it that way yeah how was that how was the filming it was interesting I mean it was actually my first time out at um, headquarters in California so that was nice and we did the whole camera thing and the screen thing so it was it was an interesting experience it's a little bit more stressful than I expected. <laughs> It's more that we don't often get that kind of Hollywood moment in the programming industry. It must have been fun. Yeah, it was good. Um, so the topic that we're talking about today is cloud networking. I'm going to start with a naive question. You can tell me why I'm wrong. Right? Cloud networking, it's all in the cloud. So you just open a network connection and that's it, right? Life is easy. Why would yeah. there be any problems with cloud networking? Yeah, you, you just... You just told you explained the whole podcast. We don't need the podcast anymore, or we don't need okay. the course anymore. <laughs> um, no, yeah, it's networking. You know, getting up and running can be pretty easy to do, right? We have we have the public shared uh, secure public endpoints is what we call it in the in the in the course. But basically, Kafka clusters that are available publicly are should be the default option for you. But depending on who the customer is and depending on what their infosec and security and compliance requirements are, they may have a number of things that make that a little bit or a lot more complex. Right? And that's that's what we're looking to solve with the course. Okay. Well, give me a, give me a first example. What's the first thing that makes it more complex? Um, we, we work with a lot of customers that have, you know, infosec or compliance requirements where their data can't transit the internet, right? Functionally, they say, okay, because we're handling financial transaction data or PII, mm -hmm. PHI or something along those lines, they're not allowed to have their data accessible over the internet or even transit the internet, which means we need some form of private networking option between where their Kafka clients are running and the Kafka cluster that we're running for them in Confluent Cloud, right? And so that requires you know, some additional configuration, requires some additional preemptive forethought around how you're actually building the architecture, and then requires you know, configuring everything, which is you know, where it gets a little bit more complex. Is that like, so are they saying you basically got to be co-located in the same building or has it got to be private connection between separate data centers? Uh, it, it depends on the organization, right? Um, at, at its core, the physical location of it doesn't traditionally or te often matter as much 
as the network security, right? So while under the hood, they may be running at the same data center or set of data centers, what really matters more is that it's um, transiting over a private network connection between different clouds or between, you know, different networks or whatever the case may be in your environment. Yeah. And sometimes, yeah, sometimes it just, um, it comes down to even like firewall rules, right? When you think about it, right? Like it's much easier to write a firewall rule for like three IPs that are inside of the same IP address space as your existing network, as opposed to having to basically open up your clients to an entire, you know, CSP cloud provider IP range or to allow egress traffic to the internet from your, your internal applications, right? Yeah, because you you often find that um, like cloud providers, they're expecting you to be pretty flexible on which IP addresses that you're actually going to connect to, right? Yeah, usually they're you know IPs in cloud providers are generally ephemeral, right? It actually like costs additional money to have kind of a static IP address most times in, in cloud providers, especially a public facing one. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, it's kind of you know, cloud providers kind of operate on this idea that, you know, the host name is relatively static, but the IPs are ephemeral and can change at any time. So that complicates, especially for legacy organizations, maybe they have some on-premise workloads to open up their, you know, firewalls that only allow for IP address-based rules, um, you know, out to cloud applications. Yeah. So I'm guessing we're talking about often like companies like banks, right? Those, those would be the classic, we have special rules and they're not negotiable. Yeah, have, the, you, have you worked with any banks directly on this and how's it gone? Dennis, you want to go first? Dennis. Yeah, so um, yeah, so generally like in the financial services industry, um, there's very specific compliance requirements, either from a you know an internal organizational level or just from a you know government entity, you know. We want to make sure that everybody's money is safe, right? So yeah. um, clouds, you know, when working inside of a cloud at a bank, you have to be very prescriptive on where traffic is entering from and where it's leaving to. Um, and so usually that necessitates having some sort of private networking, whether it be a direct, you know, a direct connection or peering. Generally, it's more of a unidirectional connection. So that's why banks normally prefer something like a private link connection where they can only egress out to Confluent Cloud, but Confluent Cloud and other, you know, CSP products can't reach back into their networks. Right. So you're, hang on, how is this actually working? You're, there you are, you're running a cloud service. Are you having to set up on the side VPNs between certain banks or what's going on under the hood? Yeah, kind of under the hood, it kind of works like a VPN. You effectively create a a logical private network connection. You land, um, you know, endpoints inside of, you know, in this case, like the bank's VPC. um, And then you allocate some IP address space to those endpoints. And then all of the services, you know, and applications inside of the bank's network can connect to this external service um, just by hitting those IP address you know, endpoints that exist inside of their network. Yeah. Okay. Is that, is that usually a technical problem or kind of negotiating with the various teams in the bank problem? Usually from what I've seen, it's usually the various teams within the bank say you have to do this, right? This, this is like our requirement from an InfoSec perspective is you have to use private link or the equivalent service and whatever the cloud provider is. Mm-hmm. And then once you've, they've made that determination, then it's a technical problem or a technical action item to configure that, right? And, and one of the nice things with Confluent Cloud is that we provide those capabilities uh, self-service so that, you know, the customer can effectively set it up entirely, you know, just by interacting with our UI and API and configuring everything versus having to, like, talk with us and work with us to do it. So we provide a lot of the, the, mechanic, the mechanisms so that customers can set it up on their own. Okay. So I, because I've never actually gone looking for these kinds of features in Confluent Cloud myself, not being a large bank, but it is self-service. Yes, most okay. most everything is self-service nowadays. So, where do you come in? What are the exceptions? Because I know sometimes you actually get your hands dirty on this. What's the? So I mean, networking is a fairly complex problem, right? So getting the basic functional, get the cluster up and running, get the network up and running connected to my infrastructure, that part's pretty straightforward. 
right? The parts that become a little bit more complex are where where you want to do things like multi-region or multi-cloud, right? So for example, one of my uh, commercial customers uh, a year back or so said, we're going to run part of our infrastructure in Google and we're going to run the rest of it in Azure. And we had to figure out how to connect those while still maintaining those private networking capabilities or still meeting those private networking uh, requirements. Right. Well, give me some details. What was that like? So like, in our case, we, we were lucky because the customer already had um, a third party vendor uh, that they were using to connect the clouds, right? So they had third party vendor um, that connected to Azure and the same third party vendor connected to Google. And we were able to set up and basically piggyback on top of their existing connection between the clouds, right? So they say we have, you know, some of our clients are running in Azure, some of our clients are running in Google. We have a Confluent cloud cluster running in each one. They wanted to replicate data between them so that mm -hmm. if one of the clouds went down, they would have, you know, they would continue to maintain their business, right? The business continues to run. And so we architected um, some self self managed components, uh, primarily Confluent replicator. In, that would run in their environment that could connect to both ends, right? And if you go into the course, we talk a little bit about how, you know, the, the differences between private link and peering and so forth. And one of the requirements that we had is if you're doing a peering connection, you can't mm -hmm. transit through an intermediate network to get to a third network, right? So it's kind of hard to diagram with my hands, but you have network A, network B, network C. If A is connected to B and B is connected to C, then A can't talk to C directly. But, oh, okay. So we have to we had to set up things like a you know an HA proxy or an nginx instance in this case, and we have some documentation about how that how to set that up in um in in our documentation as well. Okay. So, and you cover things like that in the course. You go into the details of nginx and that stuff. Yeah. So in the hands-on exercises, we actually use nginx um, for for a slightly different. Uh, purpose, um, primarily to allow UI access. So one of the things um, when you're dealing with private networking is that the, the actual UI that you use to interact with Confluent Cloud needs to access that cluster as well to pull back, you know, obviously there's oh, metadata right. about the cluster that's available on the internet, but then obviously once you want to start looking at things like topics or reading messages on the topics, right? All that data stored on the cluster, like if that was exposed over the public internet through the UI, that would kind of defeat the purpose of the private networking. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so in order to make the UI work, you have to have some sort of proxy in the middle that allows your computer that may not be, you know, on that private network to be able to access those resources. So in the course, we set up, you know, when you create a private linked cluster or a VPC peer cluster, you have to set up. You know, we set up in, in the course an Nginx that allows you to basically forward traffic from your local laptop that lives on the internet and your home network right. um, through the, you know, the VPC and AWS and across the Confluent Cloud. This is sounding a little bit like, um, as well as being a Kafka networking course, a little bit of a how to set up your own VPC course. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so that's, that was one of the things that was kind of challenging was what is the easiest and quickest way to kind of create the environment? Cause you know, when we are creating these exercises, it almost assumes that, you know, you already kind of have all of this infrastructure, you know, this enterprise infrastructure, cloud infrastructure set up with all of your networking is already kind of predefined and in the course. We had to start from just scratch, like assuming you had nothing. So yeah. Um, yeah. A, you know, I would say a significant portion of the course is actually maybe education on um, AWS uh, networking constructs and how to create those resources and or <laughs> find, you know, elastic IPs and things like that. Um, so, yeah, if you're completely green to AWS networking, um, you know, the course is step by step enough that you should be able to get through it. No problem. And you go all the way down into details like what's DNS and what are IP ranges, right? So it's really getting down in yep. the weeds. Yeah, we create, you create everything from a VPC to, um, you know, peering connections, private link connections. You create DNS private hosted zones inside of AWS. So it kind of runs the gamut of, of those services. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. And I know another thing you were talking about was um, like telco companies, which have a different set of requirements for networking. Yeah, I, one of the um, 
customer verticals that, that I work with is the telco space, right? So I cover yeah. a, couple, a number of telcos as a you know, solutions engineer. And they have different requirements than um, financial services and other businesses, right? Um, the, one, of the, one of the big things that they do is they have millions of endpoints, right? So, you know, traditional financial service, they have a bank, they have a data center. A uh, customer like um, a telco, they have antennas everywhere. They have towers everywhere. They have, you know, and like you have to be able to connect hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands or millions of devices that may or may not all live in a data center. And right. so there's a larger number of integration points and Based on that, depending on who you are and which cloud you're in and things like that, there's different options, right? So, for example, in um, AWS, they support something called a transit gateway, right? This is basically, it's kind of like a network router or cloud router that you can connect to multiple uh, AWS VPCs and other network endpoints. And it allows you to say, rather than having point-to-point connections between everything that's running, you have everything connected to a single transit gateway or to some set of transit gateways. And then that greatly simplifies your architecture. That's one of the um, Confluent Cloud networking options that we we support, right? So we talked about that in in the course as well. Yeah. That sounds structurally like very similar to the idea of using Kafka as a backbone, right? Rather than having different systems connect into have one core channel you put everything through, whether it be this router or a Kafka topic, it's the same conceptual shape, right? Yeah, it's 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 one of the things we're seeing, right? Um, more and more businesses are moving more towards like a consolidation pattern, right? So rather than having like disparate infrastructure everywhere, like they're going to continue to have the disparate infrastructure everywhere, but having like a central place that connects to everything, whether that's like you said, the, the network component where it's a single cloud router or transit gateway that connects to all of your different components or a single Kafka cluster that acts as the central nervous system of your business, right? It's, it's the same pattern that we see a lot of businesses moving kind of directionally toward. Yeah, yeah, I can see that would be like the tension, the constant swinging pendulum between we move away from monoliths to microservices and now we need to find a way to move back to some of the advantages of having a single place to talk, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and I'll also add like the, the distinction of transit gateway versus something like private link or peering, right? Um, you know, I think it's important to realize like you can still have a central Kafka cluster, like a single Kafka cluster that's peered to many different networks or that has a private link connection to many different, you know, accounts and networks. Um, mm-hmm. The benefit of Transit Gateway is that it's basically a single place for connection to all, right? So when you provision, you know, let's say you're, you know, you're deploying some sort of, uh, you know, cellular architecture where you're, you have many, many, you're basically creating an instance of a network every time you stand up a new instance of your application. Um, you know, having a transit gateway, you can just hook the app up to the transit gateway. It doesn't require you to make any changes on the Confluent Cloud side. Whereas if you're using private link, like you would have to land a private link endpoint in that new VPC, right, that you create yeah, for the yeah. new instance. So there's that's no the way that would scale to tens of thousands of yeah. connections, right? And that's why, that's why telcos use it mostly because they don't want to have to like yeah. create these, you know, configurations every time they spin up a new instance or a new tower, right? Yeah. Uh, Dennis, you, I wanted to get from you, because you're more on the kind of, you're on the technical side, but you're also on the dealing with negotiations with people mm-hmm. side, right? What, how are they characteristically different telcos to banks on these topics? Um, it's interesting because they are, they're equally as secure from a, we want private networking, um, but they're less so concerned about the communication back and forth, right? So we, we talked about how banks, they want that unidirectional connection. Um, that's why private link is usually a good fit for banks. Transit yeah. Gateway is a good fit for telcos because it allows communication back and forth. And telcos generally have like a lot of um, like hardware vendors, let's say, right? So there's you know, the Nokia's of the world, right? All these different companies that make telco equipment. Um, you want to be able to integrate that with Confluent Cloud relatively easily. Um, you know, and, and one of the benefits of Confluent Cloud is we have a huge managed connector library. Um, yeah. And when you use Transit Gateway, because it's a bi-directional connection, um, it can facilitate uh, being able to use more of those fully managed connectors over that private networking, um, you know, tunnel, so to speak, to integrate with those, you know, external vendors more easily. 
So right. that's a big that's a big benefit that I've seen personally working with telcos um, in Confluent Cloud, specifically with Transit Gateway. Does that mean for banks you end up having to do something extra for the connectors they want to use? Yeah, generally, um, depend. It obviously depends what what exactly you're connecting to, right? If it's something mm-hmm. that's you know maybe not sensitive, right? You can usually use a, a fully managed connector. Um, the, the thing to keep in mind is when you're using something like private link where it's unidirectional um, on the Confluent cloud side, we have no way to egress other than out through the internet. So, um, you know, and, and additionally, we can only resolve DNS names that are publicly, you know, resolvable. Yeah. Um, so, so generally with banks, right, they don't have a whole lot of stuff that's poking outside the firewall that we can resolve <laughs> to a public IP address. So generally, yeah, yeah you end up having to run your own connectors locally. Um, so that's, that's actually one of the big problems that our like product and engineering teams are trying to figure out. Like, how do we, how do we allow customers that are still using this private networking solution um, that's unidirectional to still have some secure way to use connectors, right? And it's a difficult problem to solve. I'm not entirely sure how they'll do it, but we got Justin, some good engineers on it. <laughs> Wait, repeat that, Chris? Justin, do you have any thoughts on how to solve it? I mean, I've seen some of the roadmap conversations, and I think there's a lot of really interesting ideas out there. Uh, I I don't think they've decided, right? There's a couple different schools of thought around like, oh, we should do pattern X versus pattern Y. And so I don't want to speak too much as to what they're discussing internally, because, you know, it's possible that they choose something else later on. Fair enough. Yeah. Never, never commit to things on the podcast. Yeah. You'll just be expected to deliver. We're not allowed to talk about roadmap because we're not, we're not, we're just the field folks. <laughs> yeah. We're just humble programmers, mate. Yeah. yeah. So um, another thing I know I wanted to ask you was like, are there cost implications to this? Like, yeah. does it suddenly become, what's the overhead of needing special networking requirements? Yeah. So this is, this is one of those things where I'm like, it, it's my, probably my least favorite part of, of, of this subject <laughs> is like how much it costs. Right. But it's really important and it adds a lot of interesting kind of, I would say throws a couple wrenches in there, especially for really high scale use cases. Right. So things like telemetry ingestion where you're pulling in, you know, hundreds of terabytes, you know, in an hour potentially um, worth of data that, you know, half a cent or quarter cent per gigabyte AWS ingress charge over a private link starts becoming really significant, right? Or the cross AZ charges. And there's lots of kind of different, like depending on where the traffic's coming from and where it's going, you know, irrespective of the networking type, sometimes that can add complexity. Um, So peering and, and, you know, for AWS specifically, peering is very inexpensive. So I was working with a customer where, you know, using something like private link was, cost prohibitive to their business, right? Um, And peering in AWS, there's actually no, you know, there's no charge across the peering connection. As long as you're within the same region, it's free to do data. Yeah, and there's there's some charges related to if you're going across availability zones, but in general, it's much less expensive. So whenever you're, you know, choosing the networking type that you want to use, like if you're super high scale, that's a huge consideration, right? is where am I getting charged um, from the cloud service provider side, yeah. um, you know, for getting my traffic in and out of these, you know, fully managed cloud services. That's, so that comes on their AWS bill, but it's seen as a cost of carry for Kafka yeah. in the cloud. Right. It, it's, it's not something like if you're running Confluent Cloud, we charge you for the Kafka stuff that you use. We don't charge you necessarily for, you know, the AWS bill, right? That shows up as a separate bill. So, well, we when we we do like the here is the pitch. This is like how much Kafka or Confluent Cloud costs. We say this is the p- component that actually comes on your Confluent bill. And then, by the way, these are the things you should be aware of that aren't going to be on your Confluent bill, but are still going to be a cost to your business. Right. Yeah. Is it so? Is the pitch basically you're going to spend a bit more in networking costs, but you're going to spend a lot less in Kafka maintenance costs? I think the what's pitch. The trade-off we're making versus, what's the trade-off we're making versus running it on-prem? I, I think the pitch here, and and we've seen this played out multiple times, is that running Kafka yourself can be both complex and expensive, right? So from from a cost perspective, you know you have to 
there's the, the, the hard costs of, oh, we need to maintain all of this infrastructure, including the monitoring infrastructure, including the scaling infrastructure. We need to you know, put in the engineering to build it. All that kind of goes there. Yeah. And then the second part is the much softer, but still very tangible cost of saying, hey, in order to run and maintain this Kafka infrastructure, we need to pay three full-time engineers. And there is a cost to that, right? Yeah. And we see, especially with those customers that are, you know, that are in the business of doing things for their business, it really doesn't make sense to spend lots of, you know, engineering or technical resources on building a solution that other companies have done for you, right? So in our case, we'll run Kafka for you. We'll manage it. We'll monitor it. We, you know, have alerts and and we have an entire SRE team that is responsible for making sure that your Kafka cluster is performing to some SLAs. And then you as a customer or as a business can focus your engineering resources on building things that actually build business value, right? So you can say, hey, rather than spending those three full-time engineers running, building, running, maintaining a Kafka cluster, they can go build applications that are valuable to the business, right? And and that's the high-level value proposition of Confluent Cloud. The other thing is we have, you know, I, I don't know if we're allowed to say the specific internal metrics, but we have tons and tons of expertise running both Kafka and the infrastructure that Kafka is running on, right? So we have, you know, several X thousands of Kubernetes clusters running several X thousands of Kafka brokers. And we have lots of experience just from a, you know, management and monitoring and making sure that this thing is running as well as we we also have a lot of the engineers that contribute to the open source Apache Kafka project. So we, when something goes wrong, we are really, really good at troubleshooting and fixing it. And we know how to address those various issues. So yeah. it's, it's a whole story picture, right? You're like, you can run a small Kafka cluster, right? That's pretty, it's not conceptually hard to do. But when you're running in production, you don't want, um, you, you, you need that to be, to continue to run and, and, operate. You don't want to spend time troubleshooting that. And that's where we come in. We'll take care of that burden for you and you can focus on your business. Right. So it is worth the effort of jumping through all these networking hoops, you're saying? I think so. Uh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I generally say it's like at the big, like, you know, the, the networking stuff is kind of something you figure out, you know, at the beginning when you're deploying, you know, your first use case. And then maybe, you know, as your use cases expand, you know, and you have, okay, you know, first we were just connecting between an AWS VPC and Confluent Cloud. Oh, now we have some workloads on-prem. Okay, now we have to add this, you know, some new network networking type to the cluster, right? Those those things happen, like, m- much less frequently than you would think, right? Generally, you kind of plan out um, and then try to, you know, set up a networking plan and then just deploy it. And then every time you deploy a new Kafka cluster, you just deploy, you know, kind of copy and paste the network, the network topology. Uh, that being said, right, like the one thing I want to emphasize is like you don't necessarily have to get the networking type right the first time. So as I mentioned earlier, right, like maybe your first, your MVP is just to connect a couple of apps in AWS to Confluent Cloud. Yeah. And maybe the best networking type or option for that at the moment for your requirements is peering. And then, you know, six months down the road you're, or a year down the road, you're like, oh, okay, we actually need to also connect some on-prem applications. Now we need to move to private link. Like... A lot of, I've seen a lot of customers get in like this analysis paralysis mode when they're trying to select their networking type because they're afraid. They're like, oh, we haven't accounted for all of the possibilities, you know, at the enterprise. And the thing is, you, you know, A, you can, in some cases, combine some of these networking types. In other cases, um, it's really easy to migrate, right, between one cluster to the other. Like we have tools like Replicator, like Justin mentioned earlier. We also have cluster linking. Um, these things make migrating between Kafka clusters and Confluent Cloud clusters easier. Um, and so choosing the right networking type up front necessarily, you know, isn't necessarily the most important thing, right? It's making it work for your initial use case and, and the requirements at hand. So. so have you got any tips for like making that first best approximation other than go and watch the course? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think it, it's, it, it's important to kind of get your stakeholders in a room, right? I think a lot of time, and we, I think we cover this a little bit in the course, right? There's, there's kind of two kinds of people, right? Um, there's the Kafka people in the room um, that know a little bit about networking. And then there's the networking people in the room that know a little bit about Kafka. Um, and like, if, if those two groups of people are kind of operating in their own little silos during this exercise of figuring out what networking to choose, like you're probably not going to make the right choice, right? So it's important to yeah. get 
the networking people in the room, the security compliance people in the room, you know, and then the Kafka engineers in the room that know how like the Kafka protocol works and the fact that there's, you know, advertised listeners and, you know, things additional to the bootstrap that you need to be open to, um, you know, and then kind of start at the top, start at the secure public endpoints, simplest option. And then, you know, the security guy will probably say, oh, no, actually, you know, we need to have this private networking requirement. Okay, now we need to look at, you know, either peering, private link, transit gateway, um, you know, in AWS, for example. And then, okay, then start to understand, okay, what from your networking people, do they prefer one of these over the other? Is there, a, you know, an archetype that they can copy paste from some other project, right? Um but the collaboration is important between those teams, right? Because if you're just the Kafka team working in isolation, you may not know that there are archetypes that the you know the networking teams already leveraged that that you guys can leverage for your Confluent cloud deployments. So yeah, you've got to fight against Conway's law, reduce yeah. it down to one team of people solving the problem, and you'll get one solution. So is that is is that the motivation for the course then have you had a lot of these conversations and finally thought okay we're going to write this stuff down yeah I, I think so right like we we i mean part of my job part of dennis's job is to have these conversations on a day-to-day basis with customers right mm-hmm. and sometimes it becomes like the same conversation with every single stakeholder multiple times right so having it in a single consolidated place where they could say okay go watch this course learn a little bit like like the networking people can learn a little bit about Kafka. The Kafka people can learn a little bit about the networking requirements. They can get everybody roughly on the same page. Then we come to the table, we can have the conversation and it'll be a much more productive uh, conversation, I think. Yeah, yeah. Give give people the resources to do, get the backstory before you enter into the room, right? Yeah, yeah. And for the for the, the Kafka people that know a little bit about networking, like the, the good thing about the exercises is like, you know, you read, you read our, our documentation, which... Quite frankly, our documentation is actually pretty good on some of this stuff. Like, I love to rag on docs all the time, but the networking stuff is actually pretty good. Um, but it's still really dense, right? And if you're not like somebody that's familiar with cloud networking concepts or like the specific way things are named, like reading those docs is like, you know, reading Greek, right? You don't understand it. So um, having the, the videos where we actually walk through and the exercises and do the clicks and actually configure all the things. I think it kind of, for, for the people who aren't, you know, super networking experts that are looking at this course, it helps kind of bring everything together. And I think it'll help in those discussions with the networking team, because you'll have a better idea of exactly what all these things are that we're configuring and what they do. Right. Yeah. Sometimes you can have the best docs in the world, but they end up being too dense and you want to yeah. kind of boil down version that puts things in the right sequence. Right. Yeah, I think the other way to think about it is some people are visual learners, some are auditory learners, some are some like to read the instructions and some like to like watch a video. So having the course or the content in multiple formats is always a good thing, right? Just depending on who's who the audience is. Yeah. So um, maybe we should wrap up them with uh, let's start with Justin. What's the what do you think the most important thing to take away from the course is? Um, I, th- I think the big thing is, like Dennis said, get everybody in the room. Make sure you have all of the requirements kind of available up ahead of time so that you can start this conversation early, right? It's, it's, there's nothing worse than saying, okay, we're, we're going to get to production. We're like, we're going to, oh, we need to go to production. Oh, we need to re-architect our entire thing, right? So get, start the conversation early. Make sure you get the requirements in place and start um, talking with everybody who, who, needs to, who, who needs to put in input so that you can help start making some of those decisions earlier. Oh. Dennis, anything to add to that? Man, that was such a good response. Actually, <laughs> it covered on a lot of things. I guess the thing I will add to that is, um, you know, kind of going back to my earlier point, like don't be afraid to just go, jump into it, learn. Um, it's one of those things where if you're not if 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 you're not super primed on cloud networking specifically in whichever cloud service provider you use, AWS, GCP, Azure, right? Jumping in and like working on this kind of stuff, if you're a Kafka engineer, will kind of open up your eyes to some of the you know larger problem you know challenges problems with it, just integrating applications in general inside of a cloud provider. So I think it's an important skill to have, just kind of in yeah. general as an you know IT professional programmer in this world. So um, yeah, I think the course will be super valuable to to anybody who's interested in, in the topic. <laughs> 
That reminds me of, um, I heard about a guy who taught people uh, rock climbing. And he used to give them the bare minimum, inf- bare minimum information to be safe and then send them up a rock. And they would do disastrously, but they learn so much about what they need to pay attention to when he's trying to teach them. You yeah, know? yeah, exactly. So maybe, uh, maybe they can go through the exercises and do a safe, disastrous first run and then really start learning. <laughs> exactly. That's a good yeah, way to something get started. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. That, that course is available now, right? It's yeah, been published. Um, so we will put links to the show notes. But for now, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much, Chris. Cheers. Have a good one. Bye. So that's the executive summary. Should we call it the executive? Let's call it the geek summary. I feel more comfortable with that. Um, if you want more technical details, like really gory technical details, go and check out their course. It really starts at like IP ranges and what they are and works all the way up the stack. So regardless of your level of expertise, you'll be able to pick it up at the right point and run from there. There is a link to it in the show notes, so that's there waiting for you. Also, around there waiting for you, you'll find things like the like button and the rating button and the comment box. So now's a great moment to click, leave us a message, uh, leave other people a message. You know, all that kind of feedback stuff helps us to know which episodes you found most useful. And it helps other like-minded people to find us so give it a second meanwhile if your problem is that you have cloud and networking but no kafka then take a look at confluent cloud you can use it to get a kafka cluster up and running in minutes for any size of project from a little side hustle thing through to an enterprise grade installation so sign up at confluent.cloud And if you add the code PODCAST100 to your account, you'll get $100 of extra free credit to use. And with all that said, it just remains for me to thank Justin Lee and Dennis Whittakin for joining us, and you for listening. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins, and I will catch you next time. (laughs) 